Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Oak Bridge City. Uh, thank you for being here with us. We are excited to sing. We're excited to worship. We're excited to hopefully connect with God in a fresh, uh, new, uh, exciting way to where we can love him more and follow him more closely. That's the hope uh, for a gathering like today. And uh, I hope honestly that all of us, at, if we're believers in the room, uh, could be privileged and excited and energetic that we get to be here uh, with people who believe about God, what we believe about God, with the family of God, uh, singing to him together. And so uh, I would encourage you to lean in uh, today if you are, well, really, even just if you're in the room at all, uh, lean in and uh, see what God has for us together. And if it's your first time, uh, you'll notice we don't take an offering in this service. And so we ask that if you're a guest visiting with us, that you feel no pressure to give at all. I know generally people are really bummed when we say that. Uh, kidding. Uh, but we aren't going to be passing a plate. We aren't going to be doing that. We just hope again that you just can kind of sit back, relax, let this service be our gift to you. Uh, if you call Oak Bridge your home, uh, if you believe in the mission to make followers of Jesus, who in turn make followers of Jesus, we would encourage you to give, to give joyfully, cheerfully, generously. Uh, again, privilege that we get to play a part in what God is doing uh, in the world. Uh, today we might take communion. So we'll see. Every week we normally do. Uh, we take communion, but we might today. We'll see. We'll see where we'll see where the Lord leads us. Uh, and so, uh, so generally we'll take communion in here. And so, if we do today, uh, if we take communion, um, if you're a believer in the room, we would encourage you again to do that uh, as if it's the highest privilege we get to partake in the greatest meal ever. If you are not a Christian, I like saying this up front. We ask that you feel no pressure at all uh, to take communion as we ask that you don't do so. Um, this is for, uh, for believers. But again, uh, this church is designed for you to hopefully come and connect with God in a fresh, new, and exciting way. And kind of on target with first-timers and guests and that type of thing, we have an Explore Oak Bridge lunch next week uh, on the 5th, March 5th, not February 5th, uh, March 5th, right after church. And uh, it's going to be, we say 11.30, but really right after church, we'll go downstairs. Uh, we'll have have a meal together, um, and you can really ask any question you have of me and of the leadership here about our church. Uh, we'll be honest with you about who we are, uh, why we exist, and kind of tell you the history of the church. And again, you can kind of come and ask any question you'd like. Uh, if you call Oak Bridge your home, if you've been to a bunch of those, if you serve here, if you lead here, uh, you can sign up as well just to kind of come and play a part in that. Meet people. We'd, we'd love for you to kind of come and assist in that way if you'd like. But it is designed for, for people who are kind of new to the church to come and ask whatever questions you may have. And so anyways, we'd love for, for you to sign up for that. It's on our website at oakbridgecc.org. Under the event sign up tab, you can register for, uh, for that. Tonight we have the Edge for middle schoolers and high schoolers, yeah, um, that's at our Arnold location from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock, but we had our Edge last week here at Oak Bridge City, which was a lot of fun, had a good crowd, and then uh, went to Sky Zone on Monday, and uh, so things are rocking, and we would love for your students to be a part of that, and some of you are like, why don't we have a student ministry here? Because we have two students. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's an exaggeration. We have a few more than that. But we think that it's a cool thing for people to go drive an extra 20 minutes and be a part of a larger group to meet more students and that type of thing. So anyway, we'd love uh, to see them tonight. And with that said, uh, I'm excited today. Uh, I think it's a cool opportunity we have to dive into the Bible, uh, to sing some songs. And here's what I know about my life, and here's what I know about maybe many people in this room. Oftentimes, if we aren't careful, we get busy, we get distracted, and just time where you can sit, be still, sing worship, uh, maybe those times feel few and far between uh, because maybe we lack discipline. Uh, and so... Uh, I just want to give you a moment before we sing, and again, I want, I want you to lean in and actually sing today, to get excited, to be passionate about uh, the message that we proclaim, uh, but I want, I want to give you a moment just to kind of be still, to close your eyes if you want for concentration, and, uh, and just pray, and bring to God what's on your heart, ask that he would meet with you this morning. Uh, 
ask that he would kind of give you fresh eyes to see who he is and uh, what he's done for you. And so go to God in prayer. Father, I pray that today we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the Father. Uh, may we fix our eyes on him today, and may as we gaze upon him, we fall more in love with who he is. May we become more passionate about what he's done for the world and how he calls us to partner with him. Uh, in that, in this grand rescue mission. Uh, and God, in light of who you are, in light of your story, in light of the song that we're about to sing, uh, I pray that today we give you extravagant worship. Um, I pray that if we feel comfortable, sure, we raise our hands. I pray that we sing loud. I pray that we're excited again, uh, that we get to be a part of what you're doing in the world. You've loved us. You've saved us. You've cared for us. You've adopted us. You've given us your spirit. Uh, you have given us the power to overcome hindrances and sin and all these different things in our life. And oftentimes we take it for granted. May it not be so this morning in this space for those who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. And it's in his name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Let's stand up. You can say hello to someone around you and we're going to go to God and worship. Father's heart, the mystery he lavishes on us is deep, cries out too deep, how desperately he wants us.
So this morning when I was driving into church, I had, uh, first of all, I had a plan of what I wanted to speak about just for a few minutes here, but as I was coming around a corner on uh, Revis Barracks, I saw a house off to the side and I saw an ambulance and I saw a gurney and I saw a, a fire truck and a couple vehicles and, a, and it just immediately made me think of my dad. Um, so 2022 was a rough year for our family. I lost my brother, Pete in uh, August, and then two months later, my, my dad as well. So it was a tough year, um, but it was also a year of, of joy. You know, my little granddaughter, she's somewhere out there, they came to live with us in August, and so they've been with us ever since, which can be a little annoying, but it's been, it's been great. Now, we're, we're, my wife always jokes that we're going to mourn when they move out, and uh, maybe we can keep Charlotte. How about that? But my whole point in saying that is that... Um, that's one thing I've learned is that as I've gotten older and as I've gone through trials and gone into pits and gone into seasons where it's tough, it's just that I've got a choice and I can hang on and I can run for God or I can run away. And I've done them both. And I know there's guys out here and looking at you all, I know we've ran away before. So uh, but, um, I want to share a psalm with you. And uh, I don't know if you guys, you should read your Bible, number one, but the Psalms are really good, and they're just kind of cries out to God and prayers, and some of them are um, thanks. Some of them are, what are you doing, God? And, uh, but this one is one of my favorites. It's Psalm 40. I'm just going to read a little bit. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the pit, 
And some of you guys are in a pit right now, I get that. Out of the mud and out of the mire, and he set my feet on a rock. He gave me a firm place to stand, and he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to God. Many will see, and they will fear the Lord, and they will put their trust in him. So my whole point in reading that is, number one, these are the words that we have to have stored up inside of us because we're all going to go through that. We're all going to lose people. We're going to lose everybody. And that's not a morbid thing. That's a reality. And what is inside of you? What's inside your soul? Do you, do you know these words? You know, my brother laid dying on a hospital bed. He couldn't speak. He couldn't see. He probably could hear. But what was stored up inside his head and his heart? And so for me, I spend a lot of time trying to soak these verses in and really make them my own. So that's my encouragement to you guys is that we all do that. You know, what are you going to stand on when you've got nothing else to stand on? And so for me, it's Jesus, it's his word, and just keep chasing after him. So um, this next song is an old, old school. How many of you guys were at Keller Theater back in the day? Okay. I asked Brent, I said, hey, do you mind if we go old school? And he said, yep. So this is one of my favorites. It's called... Um, came to my rescue. Let's go. 
ask you at night Wanna be where you are and If you guys would, um, let's bow our heads and just take a moment on our own to go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you put a desire in our heart, a longing in our heart um, to call out to you, and you answered us. Thank you that you always answer. It might always, not always be how we expect it to be, but you always answer. And we thank you for that. We praise you for that. God, I pray that in our lives, that in our world, in the way that we love one another, that you would be lifted high, not just today, not just in this moment, but we, that we take that out into our week, into every single part of our life. We love you so much, and everything that we pray is in your name. Amen. And then you can be seated, kiddos. You can head on back to Oak Bridge Kids. Man, it's good to be here today. It's been fun. Yeah, it's powerful. Um, thanks for coming today. Um, we need to put in more seats. Uh, we will have more seats next week, but uh, now you're starting to see the seriousness of uh, if you get here early just trying to fill fill this area. Uh, I was thinking, man, if there's a new family that comes in during the first song and steps in the back, it looks like there is absolutely zero room for them. So anyways, let's try and fill the front up top uh, uh, next week. And um, let's be praying that another 25 seats in here, which is about all we can fit, is going to be good enough for a while. Because I'm not sure if I want to go to two services yet. Uh, but we are we are getting close. Um, so anyways, thanks for inviting. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being consistent. I think gathering with the people of God to look at his word and to sing his songs and all these different things is a really important rhythm in the life of believers. And I also believe that people come to know Jesus when his word is preached. Uh, and so anyways, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting folks. And we are in part 17, I believe, of our Mark series. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. I've had fun kind of journeying through the story together. And there really has been a lot of just big faith ideas who is Jesus? What's he do? How does he interact with people? And you see over and over and over again that he claims to be God, and this kind of gets him into trouble. Uh, but throughout the scriptures, you see really two things. One, it deals a lot with our horizontal relationship with God. How do we view him? What do we believe about him? And then they're, you know, and, or, I'm sorry, vertical. Oh, man, I was homeschooled. Uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Shoot, man. Um, I know that's a big conversation right now, but uh, anyways. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is vertical, right? Vertical, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Mark has, has been talking a lot about our, our vertical relationship with God, uh, and he seems to prioritize that uh, first and foremost. What do you believe about him? Um, who do you say that he is? And, and then throughout the scriptures, there's also stuff that deals with our relationships and how we deal with one another horizontally uh, in our friendships with those who don't know God, with those who do within the family of God. And uh, we'll get there, I promise. Uh, starting next week, there's going to be three or four weeks that kind of deal with some practical day-to-day -day stuff. But I love the big faith ideas, and that's kind of where we're at again uh, today. And I hope you lean in because I think God might have something for you. And last week we talked about just a massive, big, out of this world, miraculous, extraordinary event where Jesus leads three of his disciples up onto a high mountain. And what is on the inside of him is expressed, at least to an extent, externally. And so his glory is revealed before three of his disciples' eyes. His face shines like the sun. Uh, 
which is uh, crazy. His, white, his, his clothes turn whiter than any launderer could bleach them. And so it's glory being revealed on this mountain. There's a glory cloud that shows up. A voice booms from heaven speaking about how Jesus is who he says he is. You should take him seriously. You should listen to him. Moses and Elijah, two of the heroes of the Old Testament, show up. Jesus has a conversation with them about the salvation plan of God, and then boom, it's over. You had to be there. Uh, It's a pretty wild event. But what we talked about last week is that life and the mission of God isn't carried out on the mountaintop. You can't stay there. Like the same voice, the voice of God that you hear on the mountain, I believe you can hear from him, but you're going to hear from him in the valleys and on the plains. And every now and then he'll take you up the mountain. You should enjoy it. Awesome, powerful revelation moments of who Jesus is where you see things crystal clear. Those moments are great, but understand they don't, they, they, they don't, they don't necessarily stick. Like the glory of God and the light of God is veiled on this side of heaven until our King Jesus returns. And so there's pain, and there's brokenness, and there's hurt, and there's confusion, and oftentimes situations that we're going through are a little clouded and muddy, and again, challenging. And this is what you see. They come down from the mountain, and immediately this is what happens. They came up to the other disciples, and they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Already? Yeah. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder, and they ran to greet him. So Jesus is still amazing. He's still captivating. He's still who he says he is. But there's, there's chaos in the midst of this reality. There's opposition as the disciples are following Jesus, and what they're arguing about brings us back to a couple big kind of marking themes that you see all throughout Mark's gospel. So there's a boy who's possessed by a demon. Some of you are like, I have a problem with that. Well, that's fine. It just, I just don't think the original audience did. And so I believe it happened. There's a spiritual realm. And so, 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 so there's a demon possessed boy and the symptoms that this boy has, it's like a, it, it causes seizures, a total lack of self-control and he's mute. He can't talk. It's robbed him of his speech. It's awful. It's terrible. And after Jesus gets down and witnesses kind of the argument, the father of this boy comes up. The boy is oppressed, tormented, and he runs to Jesus, tells him of his condition, and and he's like, your disciples couldn't do anything about it. And that's what they're arguing about. Jesus is like, what are you arguing about? The guy's like, they're, they're arguing about my boy's condition, about how your disciples couldn't do anything to help cure this possession from this demon that my boy has. And then we see another theme come out with Jesus' response, and it's this. You'll see it clearly in a moment, but it's frustration with lack of faith. Jesus says, you unbelieving generation... How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so if you've been following the showdowns between Jesus and the demonic and the spiritual realm and sickness and disease and all these different things, you probably kind of know what's going to happen. Jesus is probably going to do something awesome here. But before he gets to the grand event... He wants to make something clear. He wants to, again, repeat something over and over and over again. What's important to me is this word right here, faith. And the disciples' apostolic ministry, they'd been told prior that they have authority over demons. They can cast out any demon, no matter how powerful. And so Jesus is weary, tired, frustrated. How is this still happening? How are you still lacking faith? Have you not heard what I've said? Have you not seen time and time and time again healings take place? Do you not know what I've made available to you? Have you not witnessed my work over and over and over? And I want to make the distinction real quick. The frustration is not with the condition of the boy. The frustration that Jesus expresses isn't necessarily in the boy, in the fact that the boy is still demon possessed. It's the lack of faith that the disciples have in this condition changing. That's the frustration. Like, 
it seems as if he says, you unbelieving generation. And so I think he's probably expressing some overarching frustration with the crowds and their lack of belief in him. But in context, this is pointed and directed at his disciples. And so he says, bring the boy to me. Bring him to me. And now again, let's try and humanize the situation. This is someone's son. And this someone is desperate and afraid that his boy is going to be like this forever. And he's present in this moment. The father would go on to say, the boy's almost died from this multiple times. It's painful. It's horrifying. It's awful. Jesus would go on to say, how long has he been this way? How long has he been like this? Seems as if maybe there's care here, concern, compassion, looking into the eyes of a desperate father. How, how long? How long have y'all been suffering with this? From childhood, he answered. This has been happening since he was a little boy. And then he says this, and I want to park here for a moment. The father says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Other translations would say, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help. And so now we run into the two character traits of God that we either trust or we don't. He says, if you can. So I think he would point out your, God's ability. And then have compassion on us, which would lead to the willingness of God. Another way to put it would be the, com the compassion of God and the power of God, or the goodness of God and the greatness of God. This is what it comes down to, and this is what we see with this man. It seems as if, though, he trusts in this. Have compassion. Take pity on us. But it seems as if he's unsure about this. If you can, do it. If, if you can. In fact, there's no doubt. There's some confidence here. Sorry, camera. <laughs> uh, there's some confidence here. You're good. You're good. Just have compassion. There's some doubt here. My son has been like this from birth. I don't know if you can do anything about it. And so just let me ask you a question. And this goes right along with what Eric was talking about in the last song that we sang. Oftentimes it works like that. Is there something in your life that is extraordinary, extraordinarily painful? Is there an area that needs healing? Is there an area of your life where you need God to come through? Let me press a little bit. You have anxiety and depression that you just can't seem to escape. You have discontentment about your season in life. Like every, all my friends, everyone else is here, and I'm not, and I kind of hate it, and I don't want to hate it. I kind of feel guilty about hating it, but I want to be there. I want to be there. You have a wayward child, an unsaved family member, spouse, a marriage that needs restoration. You need provision in your life, broken family dynamics. Are you mastered by an addiction that causes shame and pain? No one else really knows about it. And now in regards to those situations, if you have them, do you have faith in God? Do you have faith in God for those areas in your life? And if that's going to be the question that we park on, and if that's the theme of this passage, which it seems to be, we should probably define faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Are you confident that God could bring peace, restoration, healing, satisfaction in areas of your life that you need him to? Do you believe he'll make a way? 
Do, do you believe he'll show up? Do you believe he'll show out for your behalf and for his glory? And, and, and now let me even push a little bit further to make this a little bit more practical. What would this look like? What would this faith look like for you? Do you have confident expectation that you could walk through life with joy? And I mean unspeakable joy. Do you believe that you could have a peace right now and really forever that surpasses understanding Do you believe that you can be content in whatever season of life you're in? Do you believe that your kids could be redeemed to follow Jesus? Do you believe that you can experience victory over your sin and freedom from addiction? Do you believe that you could have a powerful, flourishing marriage either now or one day that points to the relationship between Christ and his bride? Do you believe that you could carry out your singleness with an excitement and passion, with some freedom to to do all that God has called you to do and be all who God has called you to be? For some of us, from time to time, the answer is this, no, no. In regards to our day-to-day, if we are not careful, this is what what Jesus is getting at. When he says, you faithless generation, it's what he's meaning. It's like you're operating in an ongoing faithlessness. We live faithless, not confident in what we hope for. And not sure of the things unseen that God promises us. And so we settle for less. We settle for less. And we begin to believe that the best case scenario is just getting by, being fine, managing our junk, putting a smile on, just getting through. Not much hope for the salvation of loved ones. Not much hope for flourishing in our relationships. Not much hope for our spiritual and mental state on a day-to-day basis. Zero active faith, but a lot of active doubt. But that's not necessarily what we see with this father. Again, let me read what he says. If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And so again, there's kind of a glimmer of faith I think you could have compassion. I think you're good. I think your heart seems to be good towards humans. It's what I've seen again, have compassion. And there's maybe a chance that you could be powerful over this. And so I don't necessarily think this father is faithless. And then Jesus responds, if you can. <laughs> I love that. Jesus is saying something powerful. He's saying that it's never a matter of if I can. I'm never in need of power. I'm never lacking anything that could bring something like this about. Nothing is too difficult for me. Let's make this clear. The only ones needing anything right now are you. You need faith and your son needs healing. And then he goes on to say this, everything is possible for one who believes. And this is important. Am I gonna get up here and say, hey, You know those situations that I just had you recall and think about, the hopelessness, the despair, the family dysfunction, the depression, the the pain, the illness, whatever it may be that maybe came to your mind when I said, is there a situation in your life that's difficult? You know what? Just have faith. Muster up faith and muster up more faith. Muster up the right kind of faith. Muster up the perfect faith. And then things are going to go as you want them to go. In fact, by his stripes, you are healed. You're a victor, more than a conqueror through Christ. No, no, I'm not going to say that because that's not what Jesus is saying. And honestly, in light of the book of Acts and in light of (laughs) the life and ministry of the one who's speaking, that makes absolutely no sense. His disciples, who he's talking to, got martyred. And so let's look at this in context. Who was Jesus frustrated with at the beginning of the story? His disciples, right? And why? They didn't have faith. They were faithless. And so first and foremost, while he loves the boy who's oppressed, he wants to teach his disciples something, and it seems pretty simple what he's teaching them. Faith is essential to access and experience the power of God. 
Faith is essential to access and experience the power of God. But let's be honest, the power is his, not ours. And we can't control the power of God and how God exudes his power with the measure of faith that we have. That's insane and it's really arrogant to think and it's actually very damaging to say. But I do love this thought. Faith in Jesus, faith in God opens us up and opens our lives up to endless possibilities. A life marked with faith, obedience, prayer, risk, all these different things, action for God. A life like that will no doubt bring about some powerful acts of God on your behalf to where he could look really good and glorious in this life. And And this is what Jesus is saying to the disciples, and it's so important because he's like, hey, pretty soon I'm going to die. Pretty soon I'm going to ascend. I'm not going to be here. You're going to need faith. You're going to need faith to do some things, to to work, to partner with me. We're going to build the church together. It's going to start in Judea. It's going to start, it's going to go to Samaria, and then it's going to go to the ends of the earth. What seems impossible will become possible through faith. That leads to accessing God and experiencing the power of God. And so, disciples, you're going to preach because you have faith that I can save people. You're going to stand up in the midst of opposition because you're going to believe that I'm on your team. You're going to have authority in the spiritual realm because you're going to have faith that heaven and the power of God is victorious over evil. What he knows is this. Faithlessness leads to inaction. Faithlessness leads to really doing nothing. If I don't believe that God can save people, save the people I love, yeah, you probably aren't going to pray for it, and you probably aren't going to share the message that has the power to do so. I think oftentimes in regards to even our devotion and our, in life and, 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 and our Bible reading and our prayer habits and all this, oftentimes we chalk it up to, well, I'm just lazy sometimes. Maybe you just don't have faith that when you get into his word that the God of the universe actually can speak to you. Maybe it's a faith issue, right? Maybe it's not a personality thing. Maybe the reason that we don't invite people to church. Maybe the reason that we aren't, you know, maybe, well, God hasn't really wired me to be super evangelistic. Or maybe you just don't have faith that God loves the people that, that, that you want to see reached. Faithlessness leads to an action. Lack of expectation leads to a lack of action. It's true. And this is what we see in Hebrews chapter 11. It's the great faith hall of fame. It's what we just started. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. And then, and then there's the faith hall of fame. Goes on and on and on. By faith. But do you know what he says? By faith, Noah did something. Noah built an ark. By, by faith, when Abraham was called to go to a new place, To essentially set up tent and be a nomad, he did because he had faith that in this city that didn't even have foundations yet, God was its builder. By faith, Moses' parents hid hid, hid their son from the king of Egypt. By faith, Moses confronted Pharaoh, left the comfort of the palace to lead the people through the plains and on the way to the promise. By faith, the army marched for seven days, wall of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab welcomed the spies. By faith, the chapter goes on to speak of men and women who conquered kings and kingdoms and shut the mouth of lions and all these different things, but But do you see the order? It's by faith. It's by faith they actually did what God has called them to do. Faith in God leads to partnering with God. Which leads us to another important part of this text in Mark. Did these things happen through a complete or perfect faith? No. No. Noah got tanked at one point. Super drunk. Read about it. Abraham doubted God. Abraham doubted God. God's like, hey, over and over and over again, I'm going to give you Isaac. I'm going to give you a son from the lineage of Sarah. And at one point, Abraham's like, look, Ishmael's enough. Ishmael's enough. I don't need Isaac. I don't need the promised one. We'll get, I'll just settle for Ishmael. Sarah Sarah laughs at God. 
Right? Moses' lack of faith and obedience led him to not even entering the land. The army that marched, they oftentimes went their own way for lack of faith. We go on and on and on, yet their faith still led to the power of God being accessed and experienced. And so here's another lesson that we see in Mark chapter 9 about faith. Jesus doesn't seem to be discussing the strength of one's faith. I don't think Jesus is saying, hey, you need to believe about 60, 70, 75%, and then it's good enough for me to work. I don't think Jesus is saying, you need 100% faith, zero doubt in what you hope for and what you don't see. The issue is the object of one's faith. The issue is for us to be able to say, I am in a pit. I am in a valley, maybe because of my own doing, maybe because of circumstances that I can't control. And things seem bleak and things seem hard, and I don't know how I'm going to get out of it, but I also know that the one who died, rose again, gave me a spirit and promised to come back, is on my side. And so again, I don't know how it's going to happen, and I don't even know for sure if it is going to happen, but there's faith in the one who conquered even death. That's the teaching. Do you trust him? Do you trust that he's good? Do you trust that he has compassion for those whom he calls his? And do you trust, maybe even a little bit, that God's bigger and God's stronger than the junk that you're dealing with. And if you do, and if you do, and if you place your faith in the object of the very one who again conquers even death, Jesus says all things are possible. The believing one has power solely on the basis of the one whom he believes in. The power lies with God. And so he says everything is possible for him who believes. And then the father, with a very relatable utterance, says this, in the midst of pain and desperation, he exclaimed, he shouted out without hesitation, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. So there's belief. In fact, there's enough belief for me to bring my boy to you, but help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. And how does Jesus seem to help him overcome his unbelief? And this is so encouraging for me, and I hope this is encouraging for your faith and your prayer life. Uh, let me illustrate it this way. I only got two more weeks of this, and so, so just chill if you're getting sick of the sixth grade basketball references. Uh, but it was last week I'm playing. It was last week we're playing, and uh, it was a close game against a team that was just as good as us, just as good as us, maybe if not better. But it was it was super close, and uh, a couple of our kids are pretty good, and they play AAU, and so they had friends kind of on the other team from the AAU circuit, which was super annoying because they were kind of trying to show off and look cool, and and the crowd was. Uh, the parents were annoying me. And so anyways, um, I, 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 it's towards the end of the game and it's close and we need a couple buckets. And so I call a timeout and I never call plays for sixth grade basketball ever. We practice once a week for an hour and a half and they just, my, my faith lacks in regards to my kids doing what I tell them to do. And so, so I call a timeout and I'm like, hey, it's going to be simple it's going to be easy. This is what you're going to do. Hey, Evan, you're going you're gonna to get the ball. You're going to dribble over here. You're going to throw it to Luke. Hey, Luke, you're going to get the ball. You're going to throw it to Max. When you throw it to Max, you're going to follow your pass with the ball screen. We're going to get a big to little switch. Max, you're going to go score a layup. If it's not there, you're going to kick it out. There's going to be an open three for you, Evan. Evan's like, okay, okay, okay. Sounds good. And then Evan gets all fired up. The parents are over there like, Evan, go get it, you know, saying all this stuff. It's a close game. It's a loud gym. And I'm like, oh. And I could see it in his eyes. So Evan pushes off his buddy, gets the ball, and there's just this look in his eyes. And I'm like, he's going to do absolutely nothing that I told him (laughs) to do. He's not even going to look at Luke. And sure enough, he takes a couple dribbles, goes right, and literally throws it over. 
the backboard. Um, and, and, and I remember like, oh, man, like, and so I called a timeout, and I don't yell much, but I yelled. I'm like, you can't do that, man. You got you, you to gotta do what I told you to do. And so anyways, that happened last weekend. Frustrating. We lost. And yesterday, we played in the first game against a team that kind of junked it up defensively. And it was a tournament game, and I like to win tournaments even more than I like to win games, right? And so it's the first game of the tournament, and uh, playing against the 1-3-1 zone, and the whole time, I'm sitting there talking with my buddy who's coaching with me, and I'm like, I'm not calling anything. Just let him play. Let him play. Let him have fun. Let him attack. Let him move the ball a little bit. I'm not calling anything. They aren't going to do it. And so we lost, and we didn't score very much. And then we watched the next game, and so that was Kirkwood. We, we played against Kirkwood, uh, and we lost. And uh, then Kirkwood played against Troy, Illinois. And this is, this is really important stuff, so lean in. Uh, and, and, and Troy, Illinois beat, beat Kirkwood, okay? They beat Kirkwood, um, the team that we lost to. And we played Troy, Illinois next. And I was like, oh, this is going to be kind of ugly. And, and so before the game, I'm like, here's what we're going to do. Draw up a couple plays. And I looked at Taylor and I'm like, I believe, but I need help with my unbelief. Uh, and, and, and I didn't say it that way, but I essentially just said, there's no way they're going to do what we told them to do, but it's easy. And so sure enough, they do it. In the first half, we scored more points than we did the whole first game, and, uh, and we end up winning 55 to 27 in this little round-robin tournament, and uh, anyways, I'm a little bitter. We're one point away from the, we aren't in the championship, is what it is, and so, so, so the reason I, I sh share that is, is because of the fact that the week before I said, hey, could you do this? They didn't do it. I had absolutely zero faith that they were actually going to respond the way that I wanted them to respond. And, and because I had zero faith, I didn't coach and I didn't do anything. And I honestly did a horrible job. And then the second game, I'm like, hey, uh, I kind of believe, but I need you to help me with, you know, like I need, I actually said this. I'm like, look, I don't even know if you guys are going to do this. Just please show me you can do this. And that was my pep talk before the second game. And, and, and then they go out and they did it over and over and over and over over and over again. Do you know how they do you know how they gained my trust and my faith by simply doing what I asked of them to do. And so how does Jesus woo this father, essentially? How does Jesus help this man's unbelief? Well, he heals his son. He heals his son. I, I, I need help. I need faith. Will you help me? Will you help me with my unbelief? Uh, yeah. He rebukes the spirit. Hey, come out and stay out. And then it does. Do you think that man's unbelief was, was helped in that moment? Yeah, I think probably. And so today, what's a good step for you in in, in having your faith built in a circumstance or a situation in your life. Pray about it. Ask him. Scriptures say we have not because we ask not, and oftentimes because we have not, because we've asked not, we blame God for the fact that he's not showing up in our lives. How's faith built in this man's life? He says, uh, I need help with my unbelief. Jesus is like, okay, cool, got you covered. Jesus makes it clear. I'm compassionate, and I'm powerful, I'm willing, and I'm able. And the question is, and the question remains all throughout the Gospel of Mark, do we trust him? Do we trust him? Do we believe him? And then immediately after that takes place, they pass through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. And he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. I would argue that many of us doubt the willingness of God to work on our behalf more than we do the power of God to do so. And maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's me. 
you know there are those songs, like those worship songs, if you're church people, if not, no big deal. Let me have a moment. But there are those church songs that are like, you know, they go like, you're, you're never going to let me down. You know, like, you're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. That one, um, there, there are a lot of songs like, you know, you won't fail, you won't fail. I have a hard time singing those. I'm serious. Like the ones that are super pointed, like I've never been more loved than I am right now, blah, blah, blah. You know, you would cross an ocean so that I wouldn't drown. I'm just going to be honest. At times, I have a hard time singing those boldly, confidently, trusting that God is willing to act and move on my behalf. It's just true. And I think oftentimes we don't, like if, 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 we were, if you were to ask me a worship set every week, I'd be like, let's start with, oh, praise the name. Then let's go into what a beautiful name. Then let's go into King of Kings. And then let's end with, um, what's another good, I, I don't know, whatever. One of the songs that just talk about how awesome God is. And I think oftentimes I hide behind the fact, well, I'm like, well, worship isn't necessarily just about me. Worship isn't necessarily, like, wor- worship shouldn't make God out to be like this lovesick boyfriend who needs me. And I, I think there's some merit to that. But I think oftentimes it's just like I don't sing super loudly over here saying you're never going to let me down because I don't know if I believe it. I remember there was a pastor one time and he said when the song How He Loves came out, And it's a super personal song about how God loves us and even God loves me. And he's like, I didn't like it. Everyone would get into it and they were singing. And he's like, I didn't like it. And I blamed it on like, oh, how he loves. It's just repetitive. I don't like the sound. And he goes, and then after a while, I just realized, no, Ben, you're, you're doubting. You're struggling to believe that God actually loves you intimately and personally. Like those scriptures in the Psalms where it says God delights in every detail of your life, those are hard for me. Wait, God, you, you, you care about my, my, my peace and my joy, and you care about my friendships, and you care about my work, and you care about my mundane Monday through whatever day. You, you, you care about my marriage. You, you, you care about my girls. You, you care about every detail of my life. Yeah, I'm good. I'm I'm compassionate. And I think if that's the case, if we struggle to believe this, I think, I think it's really wise for Jesus to move directly to his death. Hey, disciples, we just got done talking about faith. You need more faith, you're gonna have to lean on this. You need, you need faith in the fact that God is willing to express his love for you. Look to the cross. And look to the fact that Jesus bled out on your behalf. And hear me on this. In light of the compassion of God, seen most clearly in the cross of Christ, I know I've kind of hinted at it, but I just want to say to you today, God cares about you. He cares about your weaknesses. He cares about your hardships. He cares about, you know, you struggling with your season of life. He cares about your singleness. He cares about every detail of your life. He knows what you're up against. God is willing to fight on your behalf. God cares about your marriage. God cares about the anxiety. God cares about your despair. God loves you. And he loves you so much that he took upon all of that on his own shoulders. Hebrews chapter four says, we, we, don't, we don't have a great high priest who's ascended. We have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God. And so let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. Why? We don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. For we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet we did not sin. And in light of the fact that he took on all of us, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Okay, next. For some of you, you're like, no, I, I do doubt that God is strong enough to work on my behalf for my good. I think, I think Jesus is intentional in the passage, in this faith passage, to say, hey, how long has your boy been doing this? Since he was a little boy, a long time. 
And I think that's for some of us, like, you, you know, when, when Eric shares Psalm 40 and talks about pits and valleys, you're like, this has been a long one. I've been in it for a long time. I've been addicted for a long time. These relationships, this relationship has suffered for so long. I've been discontent in my soul for so long. My daughter, my son is believing some wacky stuff and this world seems to be getting wackier and wackier and wackier. They're not saved and they don't wanna be saved. They are far from confessing Jesus as Lord. I've suffered in this way over and over and over and over and over again. It's been like this for years and you're convinced that what you're up against is stronger than Jesus. And in light of Mark chapter nine and the teaching of Jesus, let me ask you a question. Is what you're up against stronger than death? You see, right after this rebuke on faith, Jesus doesn't just point to his goodness, he points to his power, he points to his greatness and his ability. He says, I will be handed over, I will be killed, and then on the third day, I will rise again. That's what I love, again, about the healing. Oh, it's been like this for a long time. Yeah, I find you're healed. And Christian, he defeated your death. He defeated your death. And if that's the case, I think he can, I think he can handle the stuff that comes before that. We get so silly as Christians at times. I'm sorry, we just do. And I d thought I was only gonna talk till 11.05, but that's, that's not the case. I think we just get silly. Oh yeah, I trust in an eternal message and a kingdom that lasts forever. And I believe that his cross and his resurrection is big enough and strong enough and powerful enough for me to live forever, forever. But this mental deal, no hope. This this relational issue, no hope. This temporary issue, the eternal stuff God can do. Temporary stuff, eh, don't know. Come on, come on. This was expressed, and I want this to encourage you, but also to challenge you. There's a man who passed away recently from cancer in our community at Oak Bridge, not Oak Bridge City, but at our other location, and he was talking about this tension between I believe, but I need help with my unbelief. And he was talking about how he's like, there's actually a lot of joy right now. I, I'm going to be done with my suffering and I'm going to be with Jesus and I'm going to be with him forever. And there's going to be peace and there's going to be wholeness and all of this. And Pastor Tom's there and he's like, but it, it, I, I, I just don't know if now's the time because like I got a kid who's 15, you know, smokes a lot of weed. And I'm not going to be there. And it's hard. And so he's like, on one hand, I really, really believe in the power and the grace of God. And then on the other hand, I'm like, ah. and I get it. I understand the tension. We believe, but on this side of heaven, there's moments of doubt and unbelief. And I think what Pastor Tom said and what I know he would have said, even at, it's like, God's, God's good. And God's great. And if you can trust that you taking your last breath is a good thing, you can trust him for the stuff on this side of heaven as well. And so today, with this man <laughs> whose boy is oppressed and has been oppressed for a really long time, I just want us together to say, I believe God, I believe, but help my unbelief. You long for faith. I have it. I have it. But I long to have more. And so help me. Man, you can come on up. And I'm just going to read this scripture. And I want, I want this to encourage you. And if we could have a couple folks move this this, these chairs stuff. Sorry, I didn't plan that out. Um, I just want to read this scripture, and then we're going to sing a song that I hope we can keep our eyes fixed on. And really, I think it's the whole message of the Bible for the believer. I think it's the formula for everything. When speaking of troubles, the Apostle Paul writes this, we don't lose heart. 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And what I want you to understand is this, what is unseen is not unsure. What is unseen is not unsure. Oftentimes the pushback in here, if you're not a Christian, is like, well, this is, you're just encouraging blind faith. No, I'm encouraging, I'm encouraging people to have faith in the one who I believe literally lived 2,000 years ago, died a death that you sure will not be able to refute with solid evidence. And then I believe he rose from the dead, saying that anyone who believes in me will live forever. You bring to me someone who makes those claims and then backs them up, I might have some faith in that guy. And so faith is not belief without proof or belief without, or belief despite the evidence. Rather, faith is a complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And my faith and Christian, your faith today rests in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the champion of heaven. And so with all of that said, come on, why don't you stand up? Why don't you stand up? And we're going to sing this song together.
All right. Um, we have one more slide, uh, that last one. If not, if you can't put it up, I should have told you. Uh, yeah, so we're just going to go through the. So some of you are like, man, we've been, I get it. Jesus is Messiah, and he heals people, and I'm supposed to believe in him. Uh, and so I just want, one, it's a good message. It's a good message still. We can keep talking about that. But two, um, over the next few weeks here, some things we'll be talking about. Unity, serving, protecting the next generation, marriage and divorce, welcoming the children, idolizing money, humility, and a couple others. Some of you are like, well, we should, let's just keep talking what we've been talking about. Um, uh, but I, I say all that to be like, okay, chapters one through nine, God's really good. Let's get the, the, ver- the vertical, let's get that figured out. Let's get that straight. And, and let's come to believe in him, who he says he is. And this impacts every detail of our life. And we're going to begin to kind of unpack some of the layers as to, um, as to what that should look like. And so if you're new, which we have to have new people here because we are way up uh, every Sunday morning. If you're new, uh, we would love for you uh, to sign up to our, our, our lunch next week, uh, right after church. It's on our website, oakbridgecc.com. Uh, please sign up, please sign up, please sign up. Uh, if we don't get any signups because we were too late getting the signups up, I might just have to push it back, but I don't wanna do that. Uh, and so please sign up for that. And uh, we hope to see you back next Sunday morning. Uh, We love you. Have a great week. Um, Yeah, that's all I got. Uh, Peace. We'll see you next, next time.